So it's great to see a lot of your uh, faces, a lot of familiar faces and some new faces. Um, so my name's Adam. If you haven't met me, I've just met a couple of new guys. Um, again, it's good to be back with you. If you have any questions um, about where we've been up till now, uh, feel free to let me know. Um, kind of catch you guys up. We spent five weeks right after the New Year's up until a couple weeks ago talking about what it looks like for a man of God to be a brother in the body, to be a part of the church. So we spent five weeks on that. I was sick for the last week. Jason wrapped that up. And then last week, Kurt got up and talked about the first half of Pride. And today we'll do the second half. We're only spending two weeks on Pride. Oh, we could definitely spend more though, right? I mean, this is going to be something that we've intentionally labeled. That a godly man subdues his pride. Because it's not a, all right, I heard it, talked about it, we're done, moving on to the next thing. It is going to be something that lasts a long time. So when Kurt brought it up last week, he brought up, what is pride? Where does it come from? How does it infect so many places of our life? And honestly, it's, it's something that people don't like to talk about. And I know, Kurt, kind of, you know, it's, it's hard to talk about it one week and not give some solutions. Because we all, like, yeah, we all know we struggle with that. But we'd like to be able to just offer solutions, wash our hands of it, and move on. But that's just not the reality of it. I asked him to speak and let it sit. So I know some of you might have thought about it over this past week. Some of you might not have. So I want to take us back and kind of put us back in that mindset because it is such a weighty topic. Um, so first thing I want to bring up is that I think pride is an internal and it's a pervasive struggle for all people, not just men. Right? We could, they could easily talk about it upstairs in the women's group. But there is something different in the way we deal with uh, and exhibit pride. Um, I think it's down to a few things. I'm going to list a few things, and then we're going to talk about God's provision for pride, which is the second week. There isn't going to be a PowerPoint, um, but we definitely are still going to be opening the scriptures. Um, the first thing I think that comes up with pride is that we all want to and have innately in us a search for significance, right? I want a life that matters. I don't want to be, you know, twiddling my thumbs for however many years I get here and then, oh, well, well that was kind of nice. Okay, whatever. No, I want my life to matter. I don't know of anybody who, who doesn't, who just, eh, well, you know, if something happens, great. If nothing happens, whatever. I, that's usually, you're usually one way or the other about it. Um, and this is going to show what you think true greatness is, Right? Um, you, could, you could see commercials, you could see movies, right? You're going to see sexual conquest. Well, that's what shows me what greatness is. I show up in showing my pride or showing my search for significance in sexual conquest or business conquest, right? I want to climb that ladder. I want to be the guy. I think there's also a little bit of like the flip side to this is that there's some insecurity, like if you're on a search for significance, but you really don't know what makes a man or a woman great, you've, if you've not consulted the person who's made life for what greatness is, you're, you're searching, you're grabbing for something that it's going to often be escapable. It's just going to be like grasping after air. You guys have probably heard Ecclesiastes that vanity, vanity, all is vanity. It's like grasping after the air, chasing after the wind. Um, so you could also have a little bit of a, like, you've learned to deal with pride, and maybe you've developed a false humility, which is really no humility at all. And, and I, I've seen, and I've, I've done it in the past, where you do a little false humility, you talk down about yourself, so you can get a pity party, and then you get other people to confirm you. This is, that, that might show up in like wanting to control people as well. That if I'm on this track to go here for this conquest, well, people along the way just become tools for me to get there. That's one way pride could show up. 
where you try to prove yourself at every opportunity you get. Everything is a new challenge and I must conquer. Um, I think it goes along with a second point of we're trying to validate our existence. Like, I, ex I must have people see me as important. I don't want to be a nobody. I don't want to be just sitting out there. But that, again, that we could have a way of manipulating people or circumstances so that we get to be center stage, so that we get to be noticed. Especially if you had, like I had a little bit for myself, an un unhealthy upbringing like a father figure who's all about chasing after the things of the world. And you're going to say, you know, in this unhealthy upbringing, I think you could, might have it two ways. One way, oh, son, you're so important. You're so awesome. You're so great. Kind of like the self-esteem movement we've got going on for the last 30, 40 years. Okay? You could have that. Oh, go pursue your dreams to the exclusion of anything else, and that's what's going to make you happy where you're told you absolutely matter, probably matter more than other people. Okay? On the flip side, you could have an unhealthy upbringing that says you don't matter. You're just another guy. You're just the skirt. You, a, a parenting strategy that really just demeans a child. And you could respond to that and say, I'm going to prove you wrong. That's kind of a response of pride even though they were wrong to say you don't matter. But it's also wrong to say you matter so much, you are like tops and all this kind of stuff. Th these are both kind of ditches you could run into that can lead to and foster a life of pride. And I think you'll also see as you go about responding to either the upbringing or your particular way of showing pride, that you're going to get the praise of men. You're going to get the praise of men. I want you guys to open up a couple of verses here of the words of Jesus that talk about this pursuing the praise of men versus something else. So the first one is John chapter 12. You guys jump over to John chapter 12, just verses 42 and 43. Here's an example of pride getting in the way for these men here. John 12, 42 to 43. Nevertheless, even among the rulers, many believed in Jesus. But because of the Pharisees, okay, the religious elite of the day, they would not confess Jesus to be the Christ so that they would not be put out of the synagogue, right? Here's fear for they loved praise from men more than praise from God. They looked after the approval of men first and foremost. That, that is going to play all kinds of havoc in your life to look at that because that's a moving target, isn't it? Like, you're, you're not always going to get the approval of men. And then you've got to chase after, oh, how do I get it? How do I get it? How do I show myself to be this image or this facade I want to put up. Um, if you'll turn over to Matthew chapter 6, again, the words of Jesus. Matthew chapter 6. Just, catch, just catching one verse here at the beginning of the chapter. Chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. Be careful not to display your righteousness merely to be seen by people. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father in heaven. Thus, whenever you do charitable giving, do not blow a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in synagogues and on streets so that people will praise them. I tell you the truth, they already have their reward. They're not getting their reward from God. They're getting their reward from the praise of men. And that's where it stops. And it's an ever, it's, it's an ever escapable thing. It, it, you always hunger for more, right? Like, I did that in the beginning of my career as a teacher. I always hungered for that. To say, that was a great lesson. I want you to do this. Can you step into here? And it, it's, it was always a, I got to keep chasing after that. I, it, I just, it wouldn't stop. 
The next thing that they asked me, oh, yeah, I'd love to do that. But I'd have to keep going after more and more. It's not just us, though, right? It's not just us. We have, like, you have your parents. You have so many other layers that add on to this, like, confusion about how do I go about what is great and what is not and how do I define these things. I think our own sin and our own depravity, sure, that's true. But let's not forget, like, we are affected by other people around us as well, right? Other people's sin affect us. It could be your parents. It could be people reinforcing, yeah, that's great. Go after that when it's really not how God defines greatness. And I think it's true for believers and non-believers. It's not like, oh, I come to Christ and then all of a sudden this thing is done and out the door. You bring your baggage with you. And then Christ has a chance to do a work. And you know, so we're starting to turn the corner here because in, in coming to Christ, you get to change this skewed view of who you think God is and who you think you are. Um, I want to read a quick excerpt, excerpt from uh, my own quiet time that I had yesterday. I was like, oh man, this is great. I got to say this. So this is someone... 1,500 years ago, very dead, okay? but very still like potent in the words they have to say. You guys probably recognize this person, uh, St. Augustine. Okay? Um, he's living in like the 400s, and he is using old language, obviously, but what he says I think is still true. So I'm just going to read this quote. It's not short, but it's not long. And first, we have to be persuaded how much God loved us so that we don't shrink away from him in despair. And we need to be shown also what kind of men we are whom he has loved, so that we do not withdraw from him out of pride and fall all the more on our own strength. And hence he so dealt with us that he might prove or profit or demonstrate his strength, and so that in the weakness of humility our holiness might be perfected. And knowing this, we should not trust in ourselves. And this is what we mean to say, to be made weak. But he himself makes us perfect. Just like the Apostle Paul says, My grace is sufficient for you, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. So he's quoting from 2 Corinthians 12, 9 there. Man then was to be persuaded how much God loved us, and what manner of men we were whom he loved. The former, we need to know, lest we should despair, and the latter, we need to know, lest we should be proud. But if you read Augustine's writings, he had lived a life of pride and all kinds of like, sin issues. And then, this is him writing later to reflect on what does it mean why, how do I understand who God is and who I am and how do I reconcile those things together? And I think he's got a great way of saying it. We need to know both, lest we despair or lest we think we're that awesome and able to do it. So after the talk last week, which uh, most of you were here for, there's all kinds of ways you could react, right? So let's take a, for instance, let's say you see hypothetical Joe, Joe Schmo acting prideful. You could be thinking of a movie. You could be thinking of someone you know at work who kind of is, because um, it's definitely not you. This is a hypothetical person. How might you react? So I, I could think of a few ways you could react. You might be able to think of others, and you're welcome to discuss it at your tables in a few minutes. You might rise up to the challenge when you see this other person being prideful and promote yourself and build your own resume. Oh, hey, well, I'm going to one. I'm going to one up you. I'm going to meet you and exceed you. Another way you could respond is you could talk them down and remind them of every single way they fail. I mean, it might be appropriate, right? It might be appropriate. Really, dude, that guy really needs to be hit with reality. And so I get that, but it's kind of like you're the one to try and humble them, and you're going to put them in their place. That's another way. I think one other way you could uh, react is that you emulate them. Because honestly, you might be jealous to say they have 
what I want. They're in the spot I want to be. They have the job I want. They're in the position I want. Uh, they've got what I'm looking for. Um, one other one is, and I, this has been me over the years, disgust. I just, oh, it is just, seeing a person just be prideful, it's disgusting. I, I just couldn't think of a better word for it. And then I'm like, ooh, but then I have to look at myself, right? Because we are talking about a, another person, but also to consider myself. So, you know, how have you responded this past week in thinking about the issue of pride and thinking about how it affects everything? Uh, hopefully you had some time to reflect. Or some of you might have, like, left last Tuesday night and maybe not thought about it again. I get that. Busyness comes. In your self-reflection, though, if you had a chance to do that, just a little word of caution before we get to some solutions here, is pride is kind of insidious. And what I mean by insidious is that, like, it's kind of stealthy and deceitful. Because you could look at yourself and say, by my own strength, I'm going to conquer my pride. That's using your pride to conquer your pride that doesn't work. That's a problem. To me, for several years, and especially when God hit me with several health issues that made me not able to do what I wanted to do, I had to stop and say, God, I must depend on you. I must. I have no other recourse. And I think that is the first and very first solution and provision that God has given. Turn to him. Turn to him. It is something so internal, so ingrained for me, for men, for women, for all humanity, that if I were to continue to turn to myself for my own solution, I would continue to fail because I'm trying to solve my own problem. I have to turn to God and I have to be honest with him and say, you know what, God, I, I got nothing. I, I tried for years. I've come up with all these ways to try and solve this thing. But I have to be honest with you. I, I, I have to depend upon you. And I had to say that many, many times in prayer for it to really sink into my own practice. And then it be, started to become my default. Not that I'm over here trying to just be, oh, what was me, and I'm so weak, and I'm so pathetic. But it was just a reality of, God, I, I have these dreams, and I have these thoughts, but I also have these issues. I have physical ailments. I have this other pride thing. I, I want to see you do your work in this thing to bring about your fruit that I cannot bring myself. Humility will not come naturally to me. I must trust God for it. So I think that's the first way that God has given us provision is to respond to him in prayer and say, really, God, when it comes down to it, I, I depend upon you. You are my source of life. You're the source of truth. And I need to bring myself into alignment with the truth, which I think is the second way. I think the second way is to say, what, what does your pride say? Your pride is confused about who God is and who you are. I now need to be brought into alignment with the truth of who God is and the truth of who I am. And let's not lose sight of this. The truth of the fact that God is now, as a believer, given me his spirit. And now he can bring victory in my life. It's not all defeat. It is all dependence, though. So I think this will be a continual thing. You're going to continue to learn to align yourself uh, with the truth. We are going to look at a couple of passages where I think you'll see, you'll see this all over Scripture. We don't have time to go all over that. I did leave some at your tables for you guys to discuss, but just to read a couple. Okay, well, if you guys will turn over with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Uh, towards the end of the chapter there, 1 Corinthians 1, 26 to 31. Think about the circumstances of your call, brothers and sisters. You're, you're calling to be believers in Christ Jesus. 
Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many of you were powerful. Not many were born in a privileged position. But God chose what the world thinks is foolish to shame the wise. And God chose what the world thinks weak to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, what is regarded as nothing, to set aside what is regarded as something, so that no one can boast in his presence. He is the reason you have a relationship with Christ Jesus, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that, as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. You kind of start to see this like, the world wants the powerful, the world wants the strong, the world wants what they think is the ideal and great to be lifted up and serve as their example or you could call idol. But that's not how God is working. He's writing to people who, who know that they're not the top dog. Right? He's picking them. He's picking them. I'm going to do something with you. He does the same thing with the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel is nothing special. They're not big. Right? They're not the most powerful nation. Right? They're sl- then they get into slavery. They're, they're definitely not powerful when they're in Egypt in slavery. Right? God chooses them. He's going to do something amazing through them, not because of how great they are, because then they could boast, right? They're cho- his choosing of them is based on what he is capable of doing. If you'll turn over to me, with me to uh, Mark chapter 10, uh, this passage might be familiar to some of you. This is kind of like Jesus' purpose statement in the Gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 10, verses 42 to 45. Jesus called them and said to them, You know that those who are recognized as rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and those in high positions use their authority over others. But it is not this way among you. Instead, whoever wants to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of all. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's what Jesus says in his own words, what the Son of Man has come to do. He's been doing it for the first few chapters of Mark. He's going to continue doing it in the rest of the chapters of Mark. Okay, one more passage. Jump towards the back. First uh, Peter. First Peter chapter 5. First Peter 5, right in the middle of the chapter there, verses 5 through 8. In the same way, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. And all of you, clothe yourselves with humility toward one another, because God, because God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. He's uh, quoting an Old Testament passage there. This passage gets quoted a few times in the New Testament. And God will exalt you in due time, if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand by casting all your cares on him because he cares for you. Be sober and alert. Your enemy, the devil, like a roaring lion, is on the prowl looking for someone to devour. When I was reading these passages and the other passages that I put on your handout there, you get this sense of an upside-down kingdom that God is building. He's not picking the powerful. He's not picking the elite always. Are some of the elite coming and confessing him? Yes, sometimes they're not confessing him in public as we were reading earlier in John 12. But it's, it's a, it seems upside down to the rest of the world because the, up, the rest of the world defines greatness this way. And God is, no, this, this is greatness over here. It, <laughs> there are worlds apart. Because what is this over here? This has thrown God out of the equation is disregarded God and pursued all possible ways a man or woman or a society can elevate themselves to greatness by themselves. And I think that's the third part of something that God can only do is he can do his work within you, right? There are are times like 
at the beginning of these health issues that I had several years ago, I fought against it. And I, I questioned, like, God, why would you do this? I came out, to, I went out to seminary to be trained to, like, serve your people. And now I have all these health issues, which means I can't talk very much. This doesn't compute. Why are you doing this? It didn't dawn on me for at least a year. Of, you know, God, you're going to do something with this. I don't know. I don't like it. I really don't. I'd rather it be something else. I really would. But I am going to say, God, I'm going to let you do your work because something is going to happen with this. I don't know what you're going to do with it. I don't know what the next years of my life look like. But if you want to transform me through this measure, okay. I, I had to come to grips with that. It's kind of like Paul's thorn in the flesh that um, Augustine quoted in Second Corinthians. A couple other measures that I want to put out there but I'll leave for you guys to discuss. There are ha good habits that are true regardless of where you're at in the Christian life, like memorizing scripture. This first Peter passage here is something I put on an index card. As I read it, I was like, in my quiet time I read, I'm like, I have to memorize this. I'm my, I, this will be my habit. And it has been, it was my habit already. It just reinforced that habit of, God, I will humble myself and let you lift me up in due time. Whenever that is, however that happens, whatever. So scripture memory, I think, is going to help bring you in alignment with the truth of who God is and who you are. Another thing is the community. The community of believers you've got sitting here at your table, your own friends that you've got in the church. Because honestly, like, I can't stand up here and be like, you over there, I know that you are prideful in such and such a way. But when you get into each other's lives, you, you know us guys. Like, we're all about telling you, dude, get real. You know what I mean? Like, in the community, you get a chance to be vulnerable and honest and hold each other accountable and say, that, that doesn't compute, that doesn't work, that doesn't sound like humility. But that takes time, that takes commitment to a community of people. Um, Finding a place to volunteer, especially if you find a place to volunteer where you're not going to get much from it, right? Like John, like we write in Matthew 6, if you're doing all of your righteous deeds in front of other people so that you can get noticed and you get something from it, Jesus says, no, that's, that's not how we act in humility. So having a chance to serve in a place where maybe you don't get a lot of recognition, Right? I'd be glad to go by and say thanks to any man who's down there teaching children. It's like, that's great. But at the same time, it's a, do I do it for the praise of men or not? So that can be another way that God does his work for humility. Last one I want to offer is dive into maybe some, um, how do I say this? a little discussion and a little thinking about some theology that kind of gives some framework to God, maybe maybe you need to have a have theology and have the scriptures wash over you to really get a picture of how God has set up this world and who God says you are with and without him those are great categories that that some good study of theology can help you with so last thing i wanted to mention to you guys is I, for myself, have seen God do great work in humbling me. I mean, it is kind of weird to say, hey, I'm humble. Okay? But honestly, like, God has done something great in that in a ways that I, I didn't like, but I'd rather have the fruit. I'd rather have that fruit. And if that's the way he wants to do it, so be it. I'm willing to let God do what only he can do. And I think God can write a better story. He can draw you out of your little story that you're trying to live and maybe take pride in whatnot okay? and put you into a bigger story. He is writing a story. He is the king. He, is no, he knows where this thing is going and he's got his appointed place where it's going and you get to be a part of that. 
You don't have to be caught up in your little world where you're like top dog. Thank goodness for that. I'm thankful for that. I get to see, wow, God, you are at work uh, in this world. You are at work building your kingdom. And thank you for letting me be a part of it. So these other measures of scripture memory, prayer, theology, and whatnot are up for you guys' discussions at the table. Um, If you want to jump out of order, that's fine, because the questions are kind of based on those uh, few provisions there. Okay, so let's go ahead and jump into the tables.